Nick Crawford on Patreon asks, while the iPad Pro could now technically run fully featured macOS Big Sur, do you think Apple will ever allow this? And you know, I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions going around about what M1 and what Apple Silicon means in terms of the A series versus the M series, because they are in essence the exact same thing. I mean, the M1 does have Thunderbolt and it does have higher RAM configurations instead of just six gigabytes, it now has eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes and that's a lot more room for Mac OS to function in, but there's no difference in terms of what bits could run on what device. They could have run it on an A12XZ iPad Pro as easily as they can run it on an M1. All of that is absolutely unchanged. It's just whether Apple wants Mac OS to run on an iPad and whether they can come up with a touch-friendly interface that makes sense on an iPad. Sponsored by Brilliant. As always, members over at patreon.com slash Renee Ritchie have Q&A priority. But if you have anything else to ask, hit the subscribe button and bell because I'm always hanging for the first hour after a new video goes live and I'd love to chat with you. Gordon Taylor on Patreon asks, if the hardware is converging between Mac and iPad, do you think Apple will phase out Mac OS in favor of iPad OS next? I think when you listen to how they talk about it, these are still two very distinct products in Apple's mind, you have that old Steve Jobs analogy of the cars and the trucks. And Apple is very busy giving the truck, the Mac, all the amenities of the car, all the sort of more friendly features of the car, but they're really just making a nicer truck. They're in no way bringing the truck down to the car. And what I think makes way more sense in the future is not for Apple to try to retrofit the much older Mac OS to the iPad or try to push the newer, but not that modern anymore, iPad OS into the Mac, but to come up with what's next for everything, an Apple OS or a Swift OS that leverages everything from the Swift programming language and Swift UI and maybe a Swift instruction set architecture at some point to make an operating system that does what their silicon does. And that is scale just across devices from the smallest, from AirPods to Apple Watch, to iPhone, iPad, to the Mac, where they're independent of the endpoints and they're opportunistic in terms of the input methods. So if you have a pencil or you have touch or you have a keyboard, it doesn't really matter. It just takes advantage of whatever is available to it, but then just effortlessly handles everything, including all the stuff that will inevitably come next from VR headsets to AR glasses to automation like home robots and you know self-driving cars in the future. That to me is something that makes sense from Apple going forward, not going back or just moving side to side, but stepping forward again. Al Vanderland on Patreon. What are your thoughts on the iPad with the M1? And is this Apple's answer to touch laptops? I've never sort of looked at the iPad as a laptop replacement. And I know the marketing material has gone back and forth about whether it's a computer or not a computer, a laptop replacement or not a laptop replacement. And to me, it's always been a laptop alternative. It's a device for people for whom the traditional MacBook isn't the right fit. Because honestly, if you want a MacBook, just get a MacBook. If you wanna do Mac things, do it on a Mac. If you wanna do things beyond what a Mac can do, all of those things, that you know, sheet of glass that can become any web page, any app, that to me is the compelling argument for the iPad that it's not a Mac uh, for people who don't want a Mac. I think more likely we'll get to the hardware counterpart of that Apple OS or you know, Swift OS that I was talking about which is just like a marble or a mother box that does local authentication and cloud connection. And then any piece of glass that's available to us, any size, any form factor, or any AR capabilities that the device we have is capable of, that becomes a display when and if we need it. And we're a ways off from that, but I'd be disappointed if that wasn't sort of the next stage that we're all building towards. Wayne Dixon on Patreon asks, can I use my old Magic Keyboard on the new M1 iPad Pro? And the official answer is no, you cannot, because the actual depth and weight of the new iPad Pro is slightly different than the previous model. Whether that turns out to be just the official answer or the actual answer, we'll have to wait and see until people get units in hand to test because it might actually be unworkable at that slight difference. 
or it could be that it is almost okay, but not quite, not enough that Apple's quality control or legal wants to risk saying it's compatible, but for some people it might still be acceptable. But again, we'll just have to wait and see. Kwesi Wabbit Hankins on Patreon asks, will M1 come to the iPhone? And no, because the M1 is still technically an A14 chip. It is pretty much an A14X with just some extra things attached to it, some even more extra, extra things. So what we'd expect with the next generation iPhone would be an A15. And if Apple did want to transition to M nomenclature, it would be an M2. But because the M series is extended the way the X series used to be, it would be just too much for the thermal envelope of the iPhone. Those two extra performance cores, four extra graphics cores, and the other additional silicon IP, it just, it's not necessary and not efficient in something as small as an iPhone. So my guess is we'll see an A15 in the iPhone 13 and then an M2 in that equivalent silicon generation of IP in the future iPad Pro or Mac. And that is if Apple does iterate on those every year. Famously, infamously, they did not with the X series. Sriram on Patreon asks, what will happen to the X and Z categories for chips going forward? Probably the end of it when it comes to strictly the iPad line. It'll be more efficient for Apple if they can dual use those chips the same way they're using the A14 in the iPhone and the iPad Air using the M1 in the Mac, the entry level low power, ultra low power Macs and the iPad Pro just makes a lot of sense when it comes to economy of scales. And so we probably won't see an A14X, A15X, that sort of thing, at least for iPads. But in terms of X and Z in general, we've been widely calling what we assume to be the non-entry level, non-ultra low power version of the M series chips, M1X for lack of a better name, and just to use something that's fairly universally understandable. So Apple could make the M1X that'll go into the higher end MacBook Pros and the higher end iMacs. Those could be an M1X and whatever goes into the highest end iMacs and into the Mac Pro could be an M1Z, for example. But there again, we'll have to wait and see what Apple's, you know, as Craig Federici calls them, what Apple's crack marketing team decides to do with the silicon at that scale. Calvin Smith on Patreon asks, does the M1 indicate potential better external display support for iPad OS or just efficient supply chain management cost reduction. And sort of a little, it does mean that it now has the graphical power to run a Pro Display XDR at the full 6K resolution, which the previous generation iPad Pro could not. Uh, but it doesn't mean anything much more beyond that because the ability to do more advanced uh, external display functionality, you know, be able to do arbitrary screen sizes and screen aspect ratios would still have to be coded into iPad OS and then adopted by developers using probably an extension of side classes as they exist in iOS and iPad OS today. Alan Danzinger on Patreon asked, will the new iPads have U1 and be able to be precision findable or precision found? And no, based on everything I've seen so far, I mean, maybe we'll hear something different as we get closer to launch time, but based on everything we've seen so far, it's just nowhere to be found. And that really perplexes me because I want you on everywhere. Like you want all the things at this point, make everything as spatially precise as possible. That just seems like the future of so many Apple technologies. It is again, uh, perplexing, vexing even that it's not there. Kiran Joshi on Twitter asks, will the next iPhone also have mini LED? I think OLED is the current technology for the smaller devices for the Apple Watch, which currently has RGB stripe OLED and the iPhone, which currently has Pentile OLED. But I think those will be replaced with micro LED, which are self-illuminating like OLED, but have characteristics that make them much more desirable. They don't require the level of mitigation that current OLED displays have. I think we'll see that first on the Apple Watch, the same way we saw OLED first on the Apple Watch, and then we'll move up to the iPhone and we'll have just even better quality displays for those sizes and mini LED will stay, at least for now, the preferred technology for larger displays, everything from you know the smallest iPad up to the largest Mac. Keisha on Twitter asks, in your opinion, when are Ecamm, Final Cut Pro, and Logic coming for the iPad M1? Those apps on the Mac 
are still written in, you know, AppKit, in ProKit. Maybe in the case of Ecamm, I'm not sure, but you no, know, the twins tend to write really close to the metal. So maybe they're using some old school languages in there as well. But in order for any of that to come to the iPad from the Mac, it would have to be ported. And there's no, unfortunately, there's no reverse Catalyst. Catalyst lets UIKit apps run on the Mac. There's no, there's nothing that allows AppKit apps to run on iPadOS or iOS. Developers would have to write specific versions for the iPad, not just of the underlying app logic, but also for the interface. So as long as, whether it's Apple or whether it's third-party developers, as long as they you know, devote the resources to moving those apps over to UIKit and also to really thinking through and considering the interface, those are the steps that need to be taken before we see any of this software. Hopefully, you know, kickstarting it with Apple and all the pro apps at WWDC because a nerd can dream. Stefano Pierantonio asks, would you still recommend getting 16 gigabytes of RAM even on the iPad Pro? And I think the key point there is some people were saying that eight gigabytes was a new 16 gigabytes when it came to the M1 Max, and that was never true. The M1 Max optimized RAM in a myriad of really effective ways, but eight gigabytes is still eight gigabytes and 16 gigabytes is still 16 gigabytes. And if you need 16 gigabytes, if you know what terms like memory pressure means, you should have still gotten 16 gigabytes. But because iPad software isn't nearly that demanding yet, it's more of a waiting game. Just thinking long-term, if you foresee a future where there are more powerful things and you wanna do those more powerful things and you're planning on keeping this iPad into the foreseeable future, then always just get as much RAM as you can afford. Augusto on Twitter asks, will there ever be an 11 inch iPad Pro with XDR? And yeah, I think so. I think the reason we didn't get it now is that Apple wanted to keep that 799 entry level price point for the iPad Pro and putting the you know, XDR display, the mini LED display in there would have just blown that up. They would have had to pop it up to 899 or something. And then the iPad Pro lineup in general is more expensive and less accessible to people. That's been the history of Apple's recent technology, paying things off on the high end and then subsequently consistently, iteratively driving them down on the low end. First to the 11 inch iPad Pro, then in a few years to the iPad Air, and then in a few more years to the iPad nothing. So what does all this new, more powerful hardware mean for the future of iPad OS and iPad software? Well, you can be part of answering that question. Everything from algorithms to neural networks and machine learning, also math, science and computer science, logic and deduction, physics, quantum mechanics, game theory, cryptocurrency, and so much more with Brilliant. It's a website and app built on learning while doing and solving real challenges in real time with no memorizing long messy formulas or fact sheets, no tests or grades, all with instant feedback that coaches you bit by bit so you can rapidly improve and learn fundamental concepts literally before you even realize it. Just go to brilliant.org slash Renee Ritchie or click the link in the description. Pick a course and get started now, today. Brilliant.org slash Renee Ritchie. And clicking on that link really helps out this channel. Hit the playlist above for more on everything Apple just announced. AirTags, iPad Pro, iMac, even the purple iPhone 12. Just hit that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.